you are listening to episode 237 of the Tennis Files podcast with actor and tennis coach Christopher Crabb. Hey there and welcome to the show today. I'm really pleased that you are listening in. And today I have a really fun interview with tennis coach Christopher Crabb. And it's really interesting because I have never had a guest on the show that is both an actor and a tennis player. And Christopher is actually a very accomplished tennis player. He was a very highly ranked junior tennis player and turned pro at the age of 16. And he's actually defeated Grand Slam champions Michael Chang and Jim Courier. But not only does he have a high level uh, of tennis acumen, but he is also acted on the big stage. He began acting at the age of eight and has starred in many commercials and movies, including playing Tiny Tim in a remake of A Christmas Carol. And at age 15, he began filming the CBC slash Disney Channel television series Danger Bay, which ran for six seasons as Disney Channel's number one show that aired in about 80 countries. And he's also had a recurring role in the a hit series Life Goes On and starred in the Showtime movie series Rebel Highway. He's starred in films such as The Last Mailman, Three's a Crowd, and Lights, Camera, YouTube. So really cool stuff. And what's really also very cool about Chris is that he has an incredible Rolodex of clients that he coaches. His tennis students have included George Clooney, Alec Baldwin, Robert Downey Jr., Kevin Klein, L. Uh, Ellie Fanning, Steve Carell, Pete Wentz from Fallout Boy, Dakota Fanning, Jeff Probst, uh, excuse me, Jeff Probst, and many others. And he actually tutored Robert Downey Jr. for his Oscar-nominated role in the film Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin's, for which Christopher also served as tennis coordinator. So really cool profile here, as you can see, and that you just heard. And today we get into a lot of cool topics like. What came first in uh, in Christopher's life between acting and tennis, and you know how did one influence the other and help the other? Uh, also, Christopher's um, training in the junior days, and you know his uh, journey to turning professional, and well as you know the difficulties uh, of acting and his methodologies for teaching his students. He doesn't just teach uh, A list celebrity clients, but he also teaches other. Uh, serious and competitive tennis players as well. Um, not to say that his uh, superstar clients are not serious, as you will hear during the interview. And yeah, we talk about um, you know his philosophy and uh, what is most important to to his players' success and what is usually missing that he has to work on for them, and the importance of uh, asserting yourself uh, to some extent as a coach. So a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, we do go into also his, his role in helping Robert Downey Jr. train for his part uh, playing tennis as Charlie Chaplin. So again, just really fun interview. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's, it's definitely a little bit different than the other interviews um, just because of the cool experiences that, that Christopher can share on the big screen. So definitely do hope you enjoy it. And with that, here is my interview with Coach Christopher crab. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Tennis Falls podcast and it's really a pleasure and an honor to have on Christopher Crab on the show today. Chris, uh, Christopher, I'm really excited to have you on to talk about pretty much like dual careers that you've had and you've you've just been in, uh, you know, amazing company and done a lot of things. So, really awesome to have you on and thanks for coming on. Oh man, much appreciated. My Absolutely. Yeah, anytime, Christopher. And so First question for you, I was curious if you have found any similarities between acting and tennis and, you know, has, has one helped the other uh, in your experience? I would say it's not a little. It's kind of shaped, the two things together have shaped my life to some extent and, and the way I teach. It, it's interesting. I mean, as a kid, I started playing tennis when I was four years old and I started playing serious tournaments uh, Florida. My, my dad moved the family down to Bal Nick Balateri's, which is a, a well-known tennis academy. And uh, I was actually went undefeated for the whole year in Florida playing Jim Courier many times. So former number one guy that uh, he and I both know he's never beat me still. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, he's such a nice guy. I, bu I bumped into him 
bumped into him uh, a little ways back, and he, he's just a he's a sweet guy. And, and uh, I was fortunate to kind of grow up playing some great, great, nice guys like that. I grew up out here. I played with Sampras a little bit. Um, that's my doggy in the back. What's up, honey? Here it come. <laughs> I love dogs. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, by the way, she she's the star of the show in all my uh, Instagram stuff. Everyone just cares about sh- sh- my doggy because she's so sweet. Oh, you're a good girl. So, uh, and then at the same time, so there I was playing tennis. And at the same time, I started acting at a very young age and was fortunate to get a, a, a pretty big movie when I was nine. I played Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol with Henry Winkler, the Fonz. And at the time, you know, the, getting to meet the Fonz, if you're my age or of, of that, that generation, kind of couldn't get any cooler than that. He was the man. So uh, those two kind of things connected and, and tennis and acting were all going at the same time for me. And I kind of always looked at it as a kid. I used to kind of think, man, tennis is a little like my, my religion and acting is like this deep passion. And, and they were both happening at the same time. And I was fortunate with both. And in the end, when I started teaching tennis later on in life, after I, I did a TV series for a long time in Canada. And uh, when I started teaching, the two things merged together. And, mm-hmm. and one of the things that always bothered me as a kid taking tennis lessons is my pros would feed balls and I'd hit a lot of balls and they'd work on my technique, which was great. And then I'd go out and play and it was nothing like being fed. And they didn't come to my matches. They didn't coach me at matches. And there was this huge disconnect. And I mean, I've taken a zillion tennis lessons. So anytime, for instance, I take on a new student now, the first thing I always ask them is I say, Okay, you've been playing for X amount of time. Uh, uh, you've taken lessons, and they'll say, "Yeah." I'll say, "How many? How many years lessons?" I'll go five years. Okay, okay. How often has your old coach ever seen you play a set? And they always kind of look at me strangely and go, "Well, really, ever? Maybe I played them a set." I go, "Yeah, that's not playing a pro, pretending to play at your level is not playing a real match." So I'll say, "You took lessons for seven, five, seven years, and your pros actually never saw." That's insane. How can yeah. a coach, yet that's exactly my experience growing up all through the juniors. And I joke with him and I'll say, wouldn't it be funny if we asked uh, a Federer's coach, uh, how does he look in the matches? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I don't go to the matches. I just feed him <laughs> balls on the back courts. It's, it's insane, right? I mean, so here I am. I have this blue court that I, that I can teach at. And a huge part of, what, part of what I do is I'm having people play with each other and playing in competitive situations. And what's kind of neat during the whole COVID thing, it's obviously COVID's been this horrific thing for everybody, but sometimes you hear good stories that come out of it, which is always nice to hear. And and it's always great when there's some sort of inspiration in things. And for me, and this group of family that I teach, we became closer when I started teaching here at my house. I started teaching my house right around when COVID happened. It was just kind of this weird, I had taught in other places and I bought this house and I made this blue court and this kind of whole thing came together and we all became closer and, and more of a family than it had been in the past. And it, it's, it's really kind of been magical. And so a lot of what I do is people are playing with, with other people and it's tough because when you do a normal lesson and you just get fed balls, it's like a fantasy world. Oh, I'm hitting better. Oh, you've showed me this new thing that's going to make me better. It's going to be great. And the reality is, as we all know that have worked on anything, when you work to work on something new and you go to play, you're a mess. It, you, you don't get, you're, you're working on new technique stuff. You don't go play better. You play worse if, if you're actually trying to do this new technique stuff. And one of the things that I get to do is I get to work with people through that toughness, that, that difficult period of trying to transition into old technique, into good new technique. And uh, at the same time, teaching them how to win matches. Because people don't, you don't just know how to win a match. People don't know what a big point is. They don't know. It, it's amazing. Again, people, people that come to me, I'll ask some simple questions that you would think most tennis players would know. What's an unforced error? What's a forced error? What's a winner? And they've taken lessons from them. They have no idea. Like, it's, it's amazing. So people always go, would you tell me all this stuff that I, that I, that no one's told me? And I go, I appreciate, I'm fortunate that I can do that. But in reality, I can't believe no one else has told you this before. And I say to them all, if you just turn on a, turn on a tennis match, 
everything that we're talking about, that's what the announcers are talking about the whole time. They, they talk a little bit about technique, but for the most part, they're talking about weakness here, big point here, break point this. Again, you'd be amazed how many people play tennis and don't really understand what the whole break of serve is about. People that just kind of play for fun don't realize that if you're watching a professional match and there's a break of serve, the odds of the person with the break just to win that set has gone up astronomically. They don't realize that they're watching that. They just kind of think, oh, it's just another game. And it, again, it just, it amazes me that the stuff that I get to work with all these people and kind of grow their tennis lives. And as I said, it can be tough and it can be because we're playing real matches and all my students are very serious and, and very competitive. I don't really kind of take on students that, it, it, and it's not a level thing. I, I'll work with all levels, but I'm in, I work with people that are into it and really want to get better. And I tend to want to make a plan with them to get them to be the very, very best that they could possibly be. I don't look at amateurs or adults and go, oh, you're an amateur and adult, you're starting. Oh, whatever, we'll try it. I'm like, hold on, how, how good do you want to get? How good could we get you? And for me, that's going back to the passion and the, the religion and all that stuff. But that's what gets me up in the morning to teach tennis, not to just feed people balls and go, good, good, bad, bad. And if you talk to my students, they would tell you I'm tough on them in many ways. And, and we joke a lot about how dumb could you be? I've told you that a million times, but it's fun, but it's, it's, it's fun, but it's also, there's a seriousness that I'm pushing them. So, yeah. So getting back to your original question, they've really merged a lot because what I guess I didn't say is acting is about working off the other person. Acting isn't about being a robot and knowing your lines and just saying the whole thing is it's this give and take between two people. And with great actors, it, you can go see them do a play and, and one night you see the same actors do it the next night and it's different. You're like, oh my God, because they're, they're different that day and they're working off their behaviors. That's what tennis is. And I joke with my students that we should probably change the name of tennis to watch because amateurs don't know how to watch their opponents and any good. Yes. That's the whole name of the game. You already, you already, I mean, tell, tell, tell me a little bit about your tennis. So we, I, I, I'm curious. What, tell me about yours. Yeah. Thanks, Christopher. I mean, there's first off a lot of great nuggets in there that, that you're talking about. I mean, the biggest questions that I get are uh, routinely are, uh, why can't I play as well in matches as I do in practices? And, you know, that's a whole progression that you talk about where, yes, you know, first you can start with the drop feeding and, and all that and, and games and stuff, but then you want to integrate that technique change or whatever it is. Um, you know, into gameplay and then practice sets and then, you know, in the match. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I played for a while um, since I was like seven or eight. And then I played all the junior tournaments and high I got was around uh, number seven in the mid Atlantic and uh, 200 in the country in the 16. So that was pretty good. And I played um, division one tennis. Rock but solid. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. But yeah, it's a lot so of lessons know of learned. Better. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 man. Yeah. A lot of lessons yeah. learned. Did you have any coaches? Did did you have any coaches early on that, that were, well, first of all, did they come to your tournaments sometimes? I had a few, yeah. but it's tough. You know, you know I, I, yeah, I had them come to, uh, they came to a couple of tournaments. I mean, one of them came to like a super <laughs> national in, in, in Rockville. That was great. But yeah, for the most part, they didn't. Um, you know, I had some coaches who were really passionate. Yeah, I had them, others. Busy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I had others that, you know, maybe weren't as passionate that we were talking about, but I mean, that's why I can really appreciate, you know, I can easily sense the passion that you have for your players. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to hear too, because I, I was wondering, um, you know, you obviously are, are really, um, uh, you know, geared toward uh, getting the most out of your players' potential. Um, is, is that the case with so, like all of your clients? Because I'm wondering, I mean, you obviously have so many superstar clients that I uh, mentioned in the intro. So do, are there some that you teach where they tell you, look, Christopher, I just want to enjoy it and have fun. I don't want to compete. Or are they mostly like trying to get better and they're really passionate? Yeah, it's a great question. The latter, they're, they're, they're trying to get better and, and really passionate about it. I, I, I attract that kind of student. And if sometimes I'll get a student that's maybe not quite that, I already have my secret little devious plans to slowly try to work them into becoming more <laughs> intense and more serious about it. Um, but now for the most part, I, I just, that's the kind of, 
it's it's even it's pretty rare for me to work with someone even just once a week. I'm usually seeing people multiple times a week, and uh, uh, they're all pretty dedicated for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, Steve Carell, who did a tennis movie playing Bobby Riggs, mm -hmm. uh, who worked with pros for all that. He's He's one of the sweetest individuals I've ever met, honestly. And, you know, people always say that about, oh, this person's so sweet. Steve is just a, a heartfelt gem of a man. And his wife, Nancy, who I work with a lot also, she's, uh, Nancy was on Saturday Night Live uh, for, a, for a couple of seasons back at, uh, I think, the 90s. And I remember her on the show. And she's literally one of the funniest people I've ever met. And, uh, but getting back to Steve, I mean, he worked with a lot of people to get good for tenant for, for the movie, and uh, he is into getting better. You know, he's very serious about his tennis. And Nancy, who plays more than him, and I'm going to throw him under the bus. Nancy's better than he is. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but Nancy, but Nancy's literally one of my best students. I mean, she's she's I would say at minimum four, a, a real four or five, and she played all wow. her life as a, as a kid, and she is focused and crazy smart. I have a, a little thing, my students that just started, I don't know, like a year ago, that my students that have the combination of their the point in their level where their strokes match their understanding of the game, I, I'll tell them that they have a green jacket. Like I, I've, uh, I was in like masters, they have, mm -hmm. they have golf, they have a green jacket. And it just kind of came out one day. I said, you know, Nancy, you you got a green jacket. She's like, what do you mean a green jacket? I said, you know, like like the Masters. You've won the Masters. You you you, and it became a thing. And people are like, when do I get my green jacket? And I'm often with people like, you're not near getting a green jacket. And and this is the honesty I I have with my students. I don't BS with them. I've got a student, incredibly good, doubles wise. She she forgets a couple strategic things and a couple positioning things. And I say to her each week, the day you correct that is the day you'll have your green jacket. We we joke about it a bit, but yeah, Nance, fantastic. Steve is great. The other student who I would say is my best male student of all time is Pete Wentz. And mm. he, he's, our, our journey together is kind of funny. I taught his son Bronx. I still teach his son Bronx, who's a sweet kid, a little lazy sometimes. But he used to, so, so Pete would come to Bronx's lessons and Pete would come in jeans and he was a rock star. He'd come in, but he played as a kid. And he also, he never tells anyone this because he's a very modest guy, but he played very serious soccer, which I literally didn't find out until a year ago. But I, he played he played some serious soccer. And he is huh. a super fast guy on the court. And he used to come to Bronx lessons in his jeans and black t-shirt and he'd have his racket. And I'd say, Pete, you know, you want to hit a few? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. And he'd, I'd feed him some and we'd hit a little bit. And one day I said to him, because he's pretty good at the time, I said, dude, I don't, I don't get it, man. Like, can you not afford tennis lessons? What's, what's the deal? Why, <laughs> why, why aren't you, like, why aren't you practicing? And, and he's just, he just hadn't decided to really kind of commit and pull the trigger. And that was probably maybe three years ago. And he is my most improved male student probably of all time. And again, going back to the green jacket, it's the ability to, have your strokes and your uh, understanding of the game, everything firing at the highest level for you. So again, I have a couple of students that have only been playing three years, but they have a green jacket because they started with me and they understand the game better than people that have played for 15, 20 years. Um, they're still maybe only a three, five, but they get it all. They're putting it all together. I mean, as we know from uh, many guys, let's take Safin that we know that he certainly had most of the elements to, there, but the mental game, I mean, no, he joked about it, right? He would, there was what he'd say that there was the good him and the bad him. And we know that if he'd had that together, God only knows. I remember when he, uh, he crushed Sampras, I think it was in the finals, the US Open. It was like, yeah, who is this guy? I mean, wow. And, but he could, but, but he couldn't, you know, so he needed to keep his green jacket head together, which he didn't, he didn't keep together. But um, anyway, so, so yeah, Pete, has really dug in. And, and again, I think COVID has been a time for people like him that couldn't go out on tour. He, his tour was canceled, that the tennis became 
really the thing that kept them going. You know, I'd say a lot of my students during COVID, it's it's the one thing or the one of the few things that was okay to do, and we were very careful about, you know, adhering to all the codes and everything. But it, uh, yeah, man, he's gotten he's been nice enough to be in a bunch of my Instagram videos. Again, speaking of nice guys, I mean, seen. he doesn't he's he's doing me a favor. Obviously, they're, they all of these guys. They're, they're all always very looking to help me out in any which way. He mentions me in articles and stuff. And, and uh, yeah, again, it's, I, they're, I've got a good group. And, and another f- nice thing that I hear daily is someone will say to me, God, everyone's so nice in the group. And, and then someone else will say it. And it sounds cheesy, but it's, it's really not. And, you know, L.A. kind of sometimes I think it's a bum rap of, oh, they're, everyone's, you know, L.A., blah, blah, blah. I, I can tell you, I'm from Canada originally, and Canadians are supposed to be pretty nice. And I think a lot of Canadians are really, really nice. These are a good group of people. These are a really good group of people. And I, uh, I'm fortunate, really fortunate to have this group that I have. We do kind of fun, done them for, we did them for Pete, Pete's birthday. And another one of my students had a birthday. He's a, a kid, uh, Jack, I think it was his 11th or 12th birthday on the same day. So we did a tennis party and did a tennis tournament here on the court and we surprised them with it. And we put up all the wounds and everything. And, and that became something that we now do for a lot of people's birthdays. And uh, I think we've done it maybe five, six times. We'll get a taco truck or something. And, and uh, again, it's nice, man. It's really nice. It's really, really nice. That's nice. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you've gotten a lot of kudos. I, I read the uh, Hollywood Reporter article and Steve Carell said, he said, every time I learn something, it's the most important part of my day, referring to obviously when, when you know, you teach him and he's so kind and positive and created a sense of community. So, uh, yeah, I love that. How, how do you create that sense of community? What, what's the key to doing that? Again, a, a lot of the lessons that I do are doubles because we're working, we're, we're playing sets. So, so people get to really know each other. Mm-hmm. I've got... Steve and his wife, Nancy, uh, and one of their good friends, uh, friends, Vance, Vance DeGeneres, Ellen DeGeneres, his brother. Uh, mm. And then another guy, they play in a lesson two to three times a week. Steve's shooting something right now. But so they're together. And then often when the next set of lessons will come out, people will talk for a little while and hang out. And then I'm mixing groups. So so-and-so plays with so-and-so in a different group. So it really is, you get to know people, you know, you get to know people. and they're all really nice and, and all kind of hit it off. I teach, teach a woman, uh, speaking of funny people, I teach a woman named Ellen Kramer, who was one of the writer producers for Friends, who is her and Nancy, perfect example. Her and Nancy had never met. They're very similar levels. And I thought, oh my God, I got to get these two together at a, at a lesson. And did it. And I was right. Like, literally, they exchange numbers at the end of the lesson. They go get coffee together now. They're both hilarious. Ellen also did improv stuff and uh, I think it was called the Groundlings out here, which is, a and she's hilarious. And these two, they're, they're like best buddies now. And they've known each other now probably three, four months. Love that. It's great. Love that. Love that, Christopher. And you know, yeah, uh, sure the interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what do you mean, when you mentioned the, uh, the green jacket, I, I really like that, um, you know, the visualization mm-hmm. and what part of, you know, what element is it that you find that most of your students are missing among, you know, the mental, the strategic, the, uh, technical, uh, the fitness, what, what, what element is it that that's the toughest for them? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. In, in, tr- in terms of doubles, which we do a lot of, the positioning is tough for them. Yeah. They, yeah. They, it, it, it's not singles, you know, S- we, singles, as you know, as I know, is, is a more basic game in terms of strict strategy of it. Doubles is complex with the movement and the switching and the following each other on thing and, and solving the riddle of the middle and, and anticipating lobs. And I, I mean, two very difficult things, which, <laughs> as you know, man, tennis is hard. That's one of the yeah. things uh, I say to people that I go, tennis is hard. And they're like, damn right, it's hard. Uh, trying to get students to close on the net to to a a big part of what I do, which again, I, not many teachers, at least that I know of talk about is as we all knew as kids, because we just kind of figured it out was, you know, if someone's racket face is open, we know, oh, it's probably a slice or it could be a drop or are they blocking and close face tossing. And to us, that's like obvious, 
Nobody knows that. Amateurs come to me that have played for years and they have, I'll literally say, what shot I'm about to hit with an open face and they have no idea. So the, the watching of not being all, in a, this is an acting thing. Bad actors are always all self-involved of how am I doing? How do I sound? How do I look? That's not what good actors are doing, man. They are living in the moment. They are there. And obviously tennis, you can't play good tennis going, how am I doing? How am I looking? Oh, no. Yet for amateurs, be, be, because it's, it's not their fault. They, they're trying to learn technique late in life, which was not as hard for us learning as kids. We're sponges as kids. As adults, man, it's tough to try to get your technique down. So A, they, they've got the part that they're, they've been working on their technique. And one of the things I've, I, uh, to kind of regress a little bit about how I teach is I say to students all the time that when I started teaching, I started working on technique, which I thought, great, work on their technique. And then maybe five, six months in, I thought I should start to now explain to them about strategy and, and watching me when I, and they looked at me like I was insane. They thought, you, you told me it was about technique. And I went, oh my God, I've been teaching wrong. <laughs> this, I, this is, so at the very first lesson with it, when I teach, I explained to them that there's a couple facets to tennis. I'll use the example of chess, for instance. I'll say, if you were going to go learn chess right now, how long would it take you to learn to pick up a pawn and move it? Reality is no time. Any kid can do that. If we compare that to learning technique in tennis, that may be 10 years to learn how to move that pawn or to learn how to hit forehands and backhands. Then there's the next part of chess, which is to actually understand how to play chess, thinking ahead, seeing moves. That's tennis too. So you've got this 10 years of technique part and then the 10 years of watching and learning and angles and what shot. So I realized after that first couple bad six months of teaching, I thought, you need to explain this to people at the first lesson, that the technique is important, huge. But in the end, you're not supposed to be thinking about that at all. Of course, we all know, we know, that they don't necessarily know that Federer isn't thinking about his technique. He hasn't thought about it since he's probably been 12 years old or 16 years. So they have to learn both at the same time. So you ask me what's hardest, I would say getting bad technique switched into actual play. And just to regress on that, Robert Landstorp, who was one of my early teachers um, hmm. wow. out here because I moved, my dad moved us around uh, for tennis, my, us being my brother and myself. My brother was also a tennis player. I worked with Robert and, and <laughs> I love Robert. Uh, and boy, was he tough. And, and uh, I remember kids would come off the court crying because he was, he was tough. But for instance, he always felt that I opened up, or I did as a kid, I opened up my shoulders real early on my forehead. Mm. And he would, at the lessons, have me hit it not so open. I would do it. And then even during our little clinics that he used to do, Jeff Tarango was one of mm -hmm. his students. And he'd, Tarango was older wow. than me. And he'd say, Tarango, if Crab opens up his, sh his, sh his shoulders, he's going to run, blah, blah, blah. And all of that was great. But here's the problem. I'd leave Robert's court at West End Tennis Club in, in, in uh, Torrance, go to play another junior, and go right back to hitting my forehand the way that I was hitting it because I wanted to win. Yeah. So, again, when I started teaching, I realized how do you actually get people's technique from out of the bucket in a fantasy world in reality? And again, one of the things is I'll say to, for instance, I'll, I'll say to a junior, I just had a kid who, a young boy who, I uh, really wanted to get developed his one-handed backhand volley, not the two. He was yeah, he's young. It's hard for him. But I know and you know that none of the great volleyers volley with two. And at least at my, back in my day, they'd let you hit two-handed volleys. And it was a bit of an ugly situation as you got older and trying to figure out, am I a little two-y, am I one? So he would, he would go to play and, and go back to his two. And I said, okay, here's our little solution. Every time you hit the two-handed volley, you lose the point. Mm. Let's solve that problem. Right, he hit. He lost the. He had one two hundred volley. I said points over. He never hit another two hundred volley again. So a big part of my technique stuff is I make you do it while you play. And the best way to make someone do it is just take the point because we know the only reason they're not doing this they so badly want to win the point that so they go back to their old technique. So getting technique is super hard, but we get it done. And then again, going to the positioning and really understanding. I, I I'm getting someone will learn to close on the net. By learning to watch the racket face and seeing, are they, are your, is your opponent committed to topspin? Do you think they're blocks? Whatever it may be. 
So again, that's hard for them because they have trouble watching the opponent. And then as they get that down, let's say they start to close on the volley, then they have big trouble forgetting that they have to reset off the net. So, you know, it's just kind of like piece by piece, you, you, you work it through. But this is something, going back to Nancy, because again, she's a, she's a damn good green jacket. One of the things that she's worked on is, I don't know how many times teachers have heard students say, we were winning our doubles match, and then they started lobbing. And people don't know what to do when a, a defensive team starts lobbing. So one of the big things I work on with students is, whenever someone lobs in doubles, usually at that level, a lob comes back. And people, of course, the lob goes in, and people, you can't blame them. They get excited, and they want to get close to the net. But now the lob just goes over their head, and they've got to switch mm -hmm. with their partner, and blah, blah, blah. So one of the big things I explain is you have to realize that lob's going to create lob, and if you hang it on the service line, yeah, you're going to get an overhead. And Nancy, who has a big serve and a big overhead, took that like a fish to water, where as soon as she went back and did it, she had an overhead and spanked it at the, the net player's feet. And green jacket. A lot of students, it's just hard for them to, to, to get that stuff. But again, to me, I can only speak for the, from what I've seen in teaching through the years with other teachers teaching and people coming to me. People just don't work on this kind of stuff enough. And going back to how do you win a match? You know, how do you, how do you get, and then talk, talking about nerves. I get to talk to people about nerves all the time and ways that I, that helped me through nerves and ways that maybe through mantras, different things. Again, you know, but, but you don't get to do that with them if you don't actually get to see them in that position of being at five all in a tiebreaker. And so uh, we cover it all out here on this crazy blue court. And it's, it's, as you can see, it's, it's fun for me. The idea of just feeding balls. And, and that's, again, I don't mean to be mean to other pros, but what also blows my mind Students will come to me that have taken lessons for X amount of years. They don't know anything about the game. So I at least would go, oh, then their technique's going to be great, right? You spent all your time and their technique's not good. I'm like, what, what were you doing for a set? And the thing is, I'm a big advocate of when I say that to someone, I can see they get a look of like they've done something wrong. And I go, hold on, hold on. It's not you. You weren't the teacher. I'm a huge advocate of if you go to a therapist for, for help, or if you go to a tennis teacher for help, or if you take your car to the mechanic, they're the ones that are supposed to know. You're trusting in them to know. And it's not, you don't, if the car's not right, you shouldn't feel guilty for that. So uh, I believe it's always the tennis teacher's job to fit the student. I don't teach... Uh, a six-year-old sweet girl, the way I teach a tough agent who's a bit of a, a, a bit of a hard head. And I'm like, dude, that's not going to fly out here with me. Listen, you're, I know where you work. You're in charge. You're on a tennis court now. You don't know what you're doing out here. And if you want to work with me, you're going to let me, let me run the ship. And it's amazing how setting boundaries like that with people. And it's part of, it's part of when everyone says to me, just being honest with you here and when everyone says how sweet everyone is, a little bit of that is me training, that I don't allow people to run the show. And so they get their best selves get to come out, out here because they kind of have to check their ego at the door. And they realize that I'm pretty good at what I do and they respect me for that. And, and again, this goes back to being a young teacher. When I didn't do that right away with somebody, it, it just would get awkward where, where who's running the lesson, you know, who, who knows What's what? And, and that can be tough when you're working with important people. Again, my group with a little of my training and for the most part are just naturally great people. It's, it's again, and I mean it, pretty magical out here. It's pretty fun every day. And I'm a bit of a, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I have fun with them. I'm, I'm a little nutty and kind of running around sometimes and a little crazy and, it's kind of part of what the whole thing kind of, one of the things, it's just stupid, so stupid, but pretty much every day I have, or somebody better have trivia questions about old movies or tennis thing. And it's, I know it's, it's stupid, but it, it's so for instance, Nancy came to, uh, the other day and asked me what four football teams 
I'll ask you. I didn't know. I had to. Th- I, I, I took Uh-oh. me a while. What four football? T- <laughs> I just okay. But four football teams have never made it to the Super Bowl, and I had to really think about it. And Pete Wentz was out here, and another student of mine who is like a serious he knows sports, and he knew right away he had to hold back. And did you, did you have any? So this was, this would be a normal thing on our court. I'd be like, no, man, we're not hitting any balls yet. <laughs> we don't hit any balls until we figure this one out together. I won't put you on the spot. I'll let you think. Here's another one. I'm going to give you this one that Pete said to me, and this blew my mind. Pete goes up one day. We're talking about music. We're always talking about music. And he goes, you know the Beatles? I go, yeah, yeah, I know the Beatles. He goes, when you think of the Beatles, the name the Beatles, like, what does it conjure up for you? And I said, you know, I kind of, like, I know there's the turtles and, and you know, the, uh, the yard birds. And I kind of, I kind of think like, like four beetles with like a little weird haircut, cut, like four. And he said, that's how I always thought about it. And he said, you realize that so he had, he had, someone just told him this, that their name's the beat bulls spelt B E A T as in like drum beat. And I went, uh, Oh my gosh. I <laughs> you, you're having the moment dang. that I have. That's what I, I, me too. I went, oh my God, all my life, I've just thought of Beatles. It's the Beatles. Stupid shit like that all day out here. <laughs> this is what we do. It's, 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 oh but it's, it's, it's fun. You know, it's between the tennis. I know. I know. And we all come up with crazy things. We love it. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. really part of the other. The other I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, that's go good. Ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I, yeah, you know, that, that's part of. Um, oh, sorry, Chris, there might be a delay, Christopher, but yeah, I was just going to say that's part of, you know, fostering the community is like finding, uh, you know, interests that, that people have like common interests or just like inserting fun in there. So I really love that you, that you do that. Uh, that's a great technique that I think a lot of coaches can integrate. I thank you. And it's it, it, with the kids too. It, it's always anyone that's taught kids. It's, it's interesting because you, you want to push them. But you don't. You want to have fun. You don't want to. And I enjoy. I enjoy it with kids. And I try to kind of thing that I, I try to always set up. And it's organic for me. Is I'll joke around with you, and and we can have tons of fun. But when I say we're we're doing something, we're doing something. And we they kind of know when. And I'm pr- pretty good at kind of defining those lines. I at least, at least like to think I and. Uh, so that way I get to have a ton of fun with the kids where we goof around. But when we get to work, we get to work, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. So in terms of, you know, the, the great things that you've done, Christopher, I mean, one really interesting thing that I saw is that you tutored Robert Downey Jr. for his Oscar nominated role in the film Chaplin. And you were, uh, you served as a yep. tennis coordinator as well. So I was curious if you could talk through us uh, through what that was like. And, you know, I heard that Robert Downey Jr., he, if, if I remember correctly, he is naturally a righty and you had to teach him to play lefty. So, yeah, really interesting. want to hear about uh, how that all went down. Sure, sure. So I had just finished doing the TV series that I did. I did a, a TV show called Danger Bay that was mm-hmm. a co-production of Disney Channel here in the States and CBC in Canada. And was it was in seventy two countries around the world. It was it was it was cool. It was great. Very fortunate. I've I had a very fortunate childhood with with a combination of tennis and tennis and acting. And uh, my my parents were super devoted to all there. I've got two brothers, all three of us, to us and trying to help us achieve our dreams. They were uh, my dad is uh, was a Broadway singer. I mean, I was a was a, uh, uh, my, my mom was a Broadway dancer. My dad's an opera singer. And mm. so they both, my mom went to Juilliard. They both understood really trying to make it in something hard. And, and they, they really helped support us through all that. And, and my dad, my dad was definitely tough mm. in terms of, in terms of pushing, not a tough, it was interesting. My dad was, is actually an incredibly emotional, sweet God, he, he's from Wales and, and hmm. the Welsh, they sing and then they fight. And, and, and so my dad's got a lot of that. So we, my dad was incredibly loving and nurturing, but at the same time, tough and pushed us hard. So getting back to having a good childhood, my dad, I, I, I credit my parents a lot with getting me in positions with, with everything to, to help with acting and, and, and tennis. So 
thank them for that for sure. And so I finished doing this TV series uh, when I was 20, 20 and came back out to LA for acting because at that point I'd been in a car accident, which pretty much ended my, my tennis stuff about a year and a half before that. And it was also always difficult for me because here I was on the verge of trying to become a professional tennis player, 14, 15, you know, killing myself and then get a TV series, which I shot for six months of the year. And I obviously did the TV series, but the first thought was, should I take this TV series or should I not because of my tennis? And I thought, I'm going to take the TV series. And it's kind of a no brainer. And then they got picked up for another season and did another season. But after that season, I really gave serious thought to, should I quit the show? Because I'm 16 now, I was playing circuits in uh, pro circuits in the off season. So literally, I would shoot for six months, try to play as much as I could during the six months. I do, did wasn't in every episode. We uh, do 22 episodes, and I think I was in 18 episodes per season. So I all those other weeks, I'd practice them as much as I could. On the weekends, I'd play as much as I could. So I gave serious thought to what I should do, and I thought I'm not going to quit the sh show. I just I, something told me not not to do it. I loved acting and I loved tennis and I just kind of felt like my life was that way. But at the same time, I was still playing pro circuits and doing pretty well for not mm. playing that much. And uh, I then ended up getting in a car accident when I was 18. So that ended the tennis, which made it kind of a no brainer, obviously. I, I did the series for a couple more years. And when that finished, I had managers that had met me when I was in LA when I was 19. And they really encouraged me to come out here and, and try to you know, work out here. So I did and uh, worked out here uh, 2021. And my agent at the time, who is a really good tennis player, uh, Scott Harris, who is like a real 5-0. And he and I just played some golf to together recently. And he's, uh, he's going to gear up to play. I think he's going to play in the 70s. And, and he's, mm. he's the real deal. He's an animal. Um, so at that time, being connected with my, this agency, which is a big talent agency, Robert Downey Jr. was with CAA, which is a huge, the biggest talent agency, and th communications through the lines of that I was this off this kid off this TV series who had just started teaching tennis for like a year and really knew movie sets and and acting and was also a tennis pro. That the word went out that that I should be the guy that works with Downey on this, and so it got set up. And uh, we got together for our first lesson. And again, what a, what a good dude he was. And we were, I was 22 and I, you know, he was 26 or something like that. You know, we're kids, but you know, when you're 22 and 26, you don't kind of think of yourself totally as a kid yet, but you think you're like mature. But here he was about to play Chaplin and here I am and we're getting together. I was teaching at a house in Beverly Hills at that point. And uh, we'd meet at the house, I think three, four times a week. We do usually hour, hour and a half lessons. And I started him right-handed. I started him with graphite racket, knowing that I was going to change him to wood, knowing that he was going to have to go to left-handed. Mm. I thought, let's just kind of get him the feel of stuff. So we did a little of that and he did really well. And, and of course, the whole time, unlike talking about the teaching I do here, this teaching was all for looking good for a movie. He didn't really need to be able to actually grind out points. I needed him look of the look like he knew what he was doing so that was the emphasis of, in my mind at 22 to do that so we worked really hard man and he uh we then switched him to the left into the wood racket and he said something to me when we were getting closer to the shooting he said you know christopher the only thing i'm nervous about about this whole movie is the tennis sequences <laughs> and i went and he said this to me and and i said what are you what are you talking about He's, he's, he's an American actor doing an English accent, playing one of the most famous, you know, people of all time. He's working right. with one of the most incredible directors of all time. And he's nervous about the, the couple of tennis singers. He said, well, Chaplin loved tennis. Chaplin is on record as saying tennis is my religion. Wow. Which resonated for me, having been a kid who thought that's how I thought about tennis. So that was his deal. And I'll never forget going to set. Oh, let me regress. Here's a funny, funny story. I thought it was funny. So Kevin Klein, who played um, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in the movie, who was a, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was a, an incredibly 
great looking movie star who was a swashbuckler and uh, Kevin Klein got cast for the part. So it got hooked up that he would come out and do some lessons with me. And Kevin Klein's is a very established actor at the time. And, and I don't know how much older than me, but certainly in his, at least in his mid thirties. And he came out and he knew how to play a little bit. And I went to say something to him and he wanted nothing. Didn't want to hear a thing from me. And I thought, got it. Not a problem. I understand he feels like he knows his stuff. I'm, I was smart enough to not push as, uh, you know, having been on sets and things like that. Hey, all good, man. No, I'm, I'm here if you need. So we did some lessons and I really never really said much to him. It was all good. <laughs> we, we get to set for the, uh, the tennis sequences. And the house that it was shot at was at a house in Bel Air. And I've taught at some nice tennis courts in my life. I, I taught at uh, the house that Serena Williams ended up buying uh, that was Joel right. Schumacher. I think he bought it from Serena. And I, I was teaching at Joel Schumacher's house, which was an incredible house. But this house where they shot the movie, this court was like sunk in, in the, the, the lush grass and flowers. It was incredible. So here we are shooting and, and they go to shoot the master scene, which is this the, the, every, a wide shot of them all, the, the two of them playing and doing their dialogue. and. They shoot it. And Robert, there's a couple of things I thought, good of night. So I walk over to Robert and I go, hey, I think you, and guess who comes running across the court from the other side? Kevin Klein. How was, did I look okay? Did my thing. So the irony, and I love him. And his wife was there and said, but it was just funny to me how us crazy actors, now he cared about what I, how we, he looked. He did, now on the set, being an, as all us actors are, to some extent, it's secure. I want to hear, did we do okay? Here he came running across. And I always just, it, it, it warmed my heart. I was like, man, you look great. No, it, but it was just funny to me. So, um, so yeah, there, there we were. And it was, it was very helpful, I would say, for them. Because, again, I understood all the, everything about how the shots needed to go. And they needed certain serves put in certain places that yeah. I, so mm -hmm. it, I think I was a good choice for it. And uh, it was certainly, certainly a, a, a kick, man. I really. I really enjoyed it. And one other little story that always sticks in my mind coming out of that was at the time I was reading all the Sherlock Holmes books. I just went through this phase and I was saying to Robert, I said, man, these books are amazing. And he didn't, you know, he knew like what we all kind of know about Sherlock Holmes. Oh yeah. And of course he ended up playing Sherlock Holmes in a couple of movies, huge movies. And I keep, keep thinking when he's going to give me a call to say, thanks for turning me on to Sherlock Holmes. And he hasn't, he hasn't called me and I've lost his number. I got to re I got to reach out to him. It's been, we haven't, I haven't talked to him probably since we were in our twenties. We stayed in touch for a while and then just how things go. We just fell out of touch. Yeah, it happens. But, uh, that's, that's really amazing. And yeah, I actually rewatched that scene, uh, in Chaplin and, uh, pretty impressive. Yep. You know, he hit a, uh, like a nice lefty, uh, slice serve in the, the right corner yep. on the, uh, ad side. That was nice. Yep. That was my, that he didn't really put it in there. That was me putting it in there. But, <laughs> yeah, but the most, okay. well, the, the, watch the shot. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, yeah, and I think, didn't I, I think if I recall, I taught him to do a uh, toss under his leg. If I recall, pretty sure yeah. I showed him a little silly trick serve where you toss it from under your leg and he, and he hit it. And I remember that they'll use that, you, you know, as an actor, the little, th the little bits of things that you do, uh, you know, you know, if you're, eating an apple or you're rolling a cigarette, you know that there's certain things that the, the editor will like and wants to, and I knew that this little underhand serve thing that they'd like it. He did it. They used it. Love that. Love that. And, and one fun. of my friends, yeah, no, it's pretty awesome stuff. And, and one of my friends had a question that she wanted me to ask you about por the portrayal of tennis on TV. And, uh, I mean, what do you think about it that in general, do you think that it's, you know, they do a good job uh, generally or not, not such a great job. I mean, sometimes like the physics of it can seem off and, you know, maybe you could name like a movie that you think did it really well yeah. and one that maybe didn't do it so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, during Danger Bay, the show that I did, of course they needing six seasons of episodes, uh -huh. always were trying to pull plots out of things and they made my character, which was Kind of, always kind of hilarious. They made my character that he was very good junior tennis player out of nowhere. Of course, you know, like, he was like, all of a sudden I was Why playing not? some junior tennis player, but we've never mentioned tennis. He's never practiced, but now he's, but you know, again, speaking of how they portray tennis and things, it was not good. And we shot the tennis scenes for Danger Bay and the first time they did it the second season. When I watched it, I was like, oh man, they just like your talk, they edit it all together where 
you know, I'm, I'm hitting a serve and the next thing you're at the net. And, it, and it's like, it's just, mm. they've, they've edited it together the way the editor thinks it makes it mm. move. But the problem is it doesn't look like at any sort of point that any tennis player would go, the hell was that? <laughs> so I, I'm sure you've seen a lot of that through the years yeah. when you watch stuff. You're like, man, I remember with the movie Wimbledon with Kirsten Dunst when I watched it, I, I think they'd done some kind of computer stuff and it, it looked a little, it's been a while, but it looked a little video game-ish to me, if I recall. It just, it just didn't, it just didn't vibe with me. Speaking of Steve's movie, and I don't say this because it's Steve, and I, and I, it's been a while since I saw it, but I think that, I believe they did a nice job with it. And I think again, too, they had, was it, was it the movie I think was called I, Tanya about Tanya Harding. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw it, but the skating stuff in it, I guess they were able to take the actress's face and put it, it, you thought this is, this is incredible. It looks so real. So I know that things have changed. And, and with, with uh, Steve's movie, I remember thinking, oh yeah, yeah, this looks much, much better. They had some whole points, if I recall, from kind of a higher point where you actually could see the point being played out. And I thought, yeah, this is, makes sense. What, I, what I've yet to see, and one of my students is a writer, a well-known writer in town named Ali uh, Leventhal. And she and I decided to write uh, a tennis thing for me. And again, speaking of what a great group, I asked Pete, I said, we're going to put together this. It, we're not sure if, if it's going to be a series yet or what exactly, uh, but maybe a, a, maybe a series. And I said, Pete, we're talking about doing this thing. Would you, would you be in it? Uh, and we, she had written the script and I, I gave him the script. He's like, all in, man. So then I went to Jeff Probst. And I said, Jeff's the uh, first survivor who speaking, I can't believe I haven't messaged, mentioned Jeff. Jeff is, and I say this I, with the highest respect, he is a competitive guy, man. Nice. Uh, it, is, it is awesome. He and Pete play together a lot against another two guys. And it, it's fun, man. We, these four go at it. And uh, Jeff, he's the kind of guy, I just love it. They go to their changeovers and everyone kind of starts to, we start to yak and get, get a little silly. Jeff's back baseline man waiting to serve or just on his toes. He's like not messing around, man. He's not, he's not talking. He's ready to rock. And it's, it's funny that the show he does is all about, you know, intensity and how to win. Mm -hmm. And he was super cool. And, and they interviewed me here on the court for, for the, uh, uh for, for the article for the Hollywood reporter. I, I did my article, uh, my interview. And I thought, oh, okay, I did okay. And then they sat down to interview him. Obviously, the guy's been interviewed 50 kajillion times. And I sat there watching him interviewed going, wow, <laughs> that, that guy just gave the greatest interview I've ever seen. Like, he is just so sharp and so thoughtful how he connected up things. And it's, he did it. They talked about it in the article how he mentioned that he learns st stuff from he's learned from tennis. He's used in Survivor, which... I just thought that was so cool to be any have any part of that to be in that world of wow that's pretty neat I something I've worked on with him ended up on Survivor that's what an honor but so he's a, he's a definitely like just amazingly competitive and smart player man he he really figures it out but going back oh my god we we went back to I wait I lost my train of thought we, what were we talking about I lost my train of thought we were asking oh no worries uh, we, uh we were asking. Uh, did we Down, want to go Downey on the and, the and the tenant. Yeah, where did I go? Where? Anyway. Uh, just uh, talking about Jeff, I guess, mainly. Just So, talking about, we were asking about tennis being done in shows and, 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 yes. and asking how it looks. So, getting back to, so, this, uh, so, Ali has written uh, this, this couple scripts uh, revolving a, a little bit of kind of what happens out here with tennis and these people that I teach, the plot is, is neat. It has a little bit of a Ted Lasso kind of vibe. Oh, I love what, that show. What made me think of it is, yes, but what made me think of it is you asked about tennis sequences and, and I said to Ali, and again, I'm so fortunate. I mean, if we can get this, this show going, I have so many people I could say, hey, would you mind coming out and directing this one for me? And she has a, one of her good friends is one of the biggest camera operators. He's done the last Star Trek. So he's, he's like one of the biggest 
deals in the world. And he said that he would probably direct one for us if we get it done. And my thought was, man, would I kill, because there's tennis sequences in it, to get the tennis sequences right, to be a part of me seeing something that I went, I was part of that, and that's the best tennis sequence I've ever seen. And so when you, that was what sparked it for me. I've yet to see anything that's ever blown me away where I went, whoa, they just got tennis. I mean, there's certain moments in movies when I think of the natural and I, the, some of the baseball sequences are, just, you, you know, you get chills. You're watching like, oh my God. And, and, and or, or Bull Durham, where, where it was the first time I ever heard, it was so great, where he's talking, you can hear his thoughts when he's getting ready to bat. And as an athlete, any athlete that hasn't seen it, you got to see it because you're like, that's exactly the kind of things, the crazy thoughts that are going through our heads. And that was the first movie I'd ever seen that captured that. I've yet to seen a tennis thing that really, really captured it. So one of my dreams and goals is to get that done on, on, and be part of that in some way, for sure. Love that, Christopher. Yeah, let me know when that's uh, done and uh, we'll have you back on and promote it for sure. So Love that. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, curious. Oh, my pleasure. And I was curious, you know, uh, throughout the years of your, your coaching, um, is there anything in your philosophy or approach changed as you've kind of like experienced coaching and studied it and so forth? I, I simply think that my, my knowledge of how to get things across to people, how to I've always been, I would like to say I've always been good at it, but, but my students often will joke that they'll say that you're in my, my brain. And mm-hmm. I often will tell someone what they were thinking while they were playing a point and they can't understand how I would, I would know that. But as a teacher that's t- taught a long time and as a player, that for me as a player, I was a very small kid. And I certainly wasn't beating anyone because of my massive power when I played courier. Every time I played him, everyone thought, oh, he's going to kill me this time because he was bigger and stronger than me. But I was definitely smart and tough. So I think I've always kind of used my brain intelligently for tennis, which has probably really helped my teaching. And I think I've, as the years have gone by and I've taught a lot, I've even kind of expanded that. So definitely that has changed for me. And in terms of, again, I think I, I got better at as I was saying earlier, just knowing how to set the boundaries in a, in a, I don't mean boundary sounds like a negative thing, how to kind of in a loving, sweet, yet at times tough, do get together. Something that I, I say to my students a lot that, that is really important to me is I've taken on later in life here, uh, golf. I've, I've tried, I'm trying to become a scratch golfer and I'm, I, I work pretty hard at it and, Boy, talk about a tough sport. It's, do, you play, do you play any golf? A little bit. Uh, not that great at it, but uh, it's fun. <laughs> it's just hard, man. Yeah. So, oh, right? so I think sometimes teachers are like, yeah, I'm teaching this person a tennis lesson and, and it's cool and we'll do the hour together and they'll go home. But if you're working with somebody that's serious about it, like, for instance, I'm serious about my golf, they don't just go home. They get in their car. And they're like, how am I doing? Am I getting better? Am I getting worse? Why did I lose that match? Why can't I get my top? And it's a serious responsibility as a teacher. And I take it wildly serious. Seriously, ser- I, it's really important to me. I can't imagine. I went through 10 golf teachers to find the golf teacher that I have. And I'm going to shout out to, uh, to Brady, Brady Riggs, who's in golf magazines, always top 100 teachers uh, in the United States and works with great pros and, and he's a genius. And we actually did a couple of videos together, but he's a different level teacher than anyone I had worked for, like not even close. And if he, if, if he didn't give me a, the, all he had at the lessons, I wouldn't be working with him. You know, I take it seriously. And again, my students are all taking it seriously. So man, oh man, I, I dig in with them and I am, I am all about, uh, let's, make this team together and let's take you as far as you can, can go. Uh, and I, I'm passionate about that and, and they know it and they know it and it's what makes it fun for me and it makes it fun for them. So that, that I think that part through the years has grown for me where, where 
that I, I, as I've gotten older, or, and maybe it's because a little bit my or my golf, I always cared, man, did I care. But there's something a little different for me now, where it it uh, it means a lot to me. It, you know, it means a lot to me. There, it's their tennis lives, and I I say to them all the time, I know if I asked you, or if you were out to dinner with a friend, and they said, tell me, you know, the five most important things in your life. I know that they, of course, would say their family and, and their loved ones and their health. And tennis would probably be in that top five of things that they love, for sure. That's why they're out on the damn tennis court four or five, six days a week. They, they love it. And they, they being, to me, all students of tennis, that, that they deserve the best. And sometimes it can be, it, sometimes it frustrates me. I've, I've actually sat across uh, where I used to teach. Oh man, it was tough for me. I watched, I watched this guy teaching a, a little kid and the mom was there and the little kid was hitting, um, I think he was hitting, if I can recall, he was hitting right-handed forehands mm. and his grip was backwards on his backhand. Mm. And so he's got his, right. So literally the guy's feeding him ball after ball. Dang. I'm like, crazy. Man, oh man, oh man. It's crazy. And I'm saying, I'm like, do I go tell them? I mean, how much money? And I couldn't help myself. And I walked up and I said, let me first just check. Is your kid right-handed or left-handed? Let me make sure, see what's going on here. She, she looked at me and she said, right-handed. So, so and his, she, he said, his hands are backwards on, on his backhand. And you, you might want to mention. And it's a common thing I, with kids. They forget. They get their, but this teacher's sure. for 20 minutes. So, so again, I, it, it bugs me. I, I, I wish for everybody that they had good teaching and it's something that as I've, uh, as I've realized more and more, I get a lot of students that will tell me, yeah, no, I'm not a good athlete. I'm, I, I was never good at, at anything. And I, I tried taking tennis lessons when I was good. I, when I was a kid, I was no good. And I watch them and I go, let's go find your old tennis teacher and strangle them because they're wrong and they clearly didn't teach you well. And, you know, in life, we all get one chance at starting something. The first time a kid picks up a baseball, the very first time and goes to throw it, they're going to throw it. Probably not going to throw it correctly. You pick, so it picks up a football, and I'm going to guess, usually doesn't put, get the right grip on it and have the right technique. Certainly, we know it's rare for a kid to pick up a tennis racket and hit a perfect forehand. If, if we find that, let's, let's find that kid and let's start coaching him because it's not how it is. It's hard, right? We have to learn. You get one shot at it the first time. And these, a lot of teachers in a lot of sports teach it wrong the first time. And it pisses me off because I, I feel bad. That you, you, you get these kids that go through the rest of their lives thinking that they weren't a good athlete. They weren't a good this. And so often, and that's why we know that the teachers in schools, it, man, you know, you hope that they're teaching your kids because you hear certain kids, I love this teacher and I love this, this class. And, and so, I guess I'm getting on my soapbox about teaching is a, is a big deal. And I guess my point is the more I've taught, the more I realize that it's a big deal for people and, and their souls and their lives and, and everyone deserves the best on it. And certainly I, I do my best to do my best to do that for them. You know, what can I say? Yeah, I love that commitment. I mean, it, like you said, it's just so important. I mean, the impact that the, the teachers have on the students, uh, coaching. I mean, if you set them up with the wrong grip, all of a sudden they're going to use that grip for like 10 years until like an actual good coach will say, hey, what are you doing and all that. And so uh, a lot of years lost potentially with that. And also, you know, if you make a negative impact, you know, they may hate tennis because of the way you have taught them and stuff. Obviously not you, just a, a certain coach or whoever, but huge responsibility. You some. I appreciate your, uh, you know, commitment to it. <laughs> it's awesome. nice to hear you. It's cause that's it. That's, it's nice to have that reflected back. And it's, it's always nice to speak as one of like mind that it's like, yeah, man, it's a big deal. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Christopher. Uh, just uh, a fun question for you. If you had to pick one celebrity, uh, student of yours, uh, to play a life or death doubles match uh, at the appropriate, you know, level, of course, who would you pick? Okay. <laughs> I, well, me being me, I say to my students all the time, oh, okay, I wouldn't play with you in a thing. You're not playing well, blah, and I'm kidding with them, of course. But we joke about this. I would say I would take Nancy or Pete. Mm, love that. Excellent. Yeah, I have, please don't. I mm -hmm. have 
yeah, I have some, I have some, you said celebrity students, right? I have other yeah. students that are higher level than, but in terms of celebrity mm -hmm. students, sure, Nancy. Yeah. Well, again, they could both teach, I think they could both teach tennis at a pretty good level right now themselves. They, they know a lot about tennis, a lot. So like right. P Pete, I'll sometimes when I'm doing one of my kids clinic and his kid Bronx is in, I'm like, Pete, teach the clinic for a few minutes. I'm going to go boo, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, I mean, Pete knows what he's doing. And so does Nate. Like they, they know their stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Christopher, and man, I can talk to you both, all. They're good doubles players, both. Cool. No cool. Good. Yeah. I'd say uh, speaking of doubles, yeah, I've actually got a, a match at uh, nine o'clock, well, Eastern time. So I've uh, pretty soon. So, I mean, I could, I could speak to you all day, Christopher. Like, you've got so many, so many fun stories. Nah, I still got a little bit of time, but, um, I was wondering um, if you uh, could give three books to a friend or a student to help them improve your tennis game. Uh, what what books would they be? T tennis books. Yeah, they could be tennis, yes. or they don't. They don't necessarily have to be tennis if you think they could improve. You know, in some way. Sure. Um, well, I, I, so many of us read um, the Inner Game of Tennis when we were kids, yeah. and I think it's a magical book, and I think it's worth. I've given it to some people as a, as a, just as a little side gift kind of thing. And, and I, so there's no question that, and I've mentioned one of my Instagram things that, you know, you, you, certain coaches just have that thing and winning ugly for me is, is just uh, a, a great book. And I, and I think it's, it's has so much of what I think, especially amateurs need to understand about tennis and it's not quite what they think it is. I think people have a real, they, they don't realize the grind that they see the beautiful strokes. And I don't quite think they understand the gritty grind. And I think, uh, I think he covers that well in that book for sure. And in terms of other books that there's a book that I'm thinking of that, that was very inspiring for me. I'm trying to remember. Oh, well, hold on. Let me, oh, what a terrible brother I'm being. My, my brother, Eric, my God, I'm the worst brother ever. <laughs> my brother Eric, who uh, was also a tennis pro, and is an ama has an, his own amazing story in that he we were in the car accident together, and his tennis also was done at that point. Wow. And he had to for me. I was still doing the TV series, so it didn't kind of throw my life as much as it threw his life because he had to kind of now. And he decided that he wanted to become a singer, and I mentioned my dad was an opera singer, and mm -hmm. uh, but Eric's natural singing voice was okay but it wasn't like eric could just be a rock star singer and he decided he really wanted to and we were actually in a, in a band together because i always play drum i play drums but that's a different different story but but uh so he decided that he wanted to become a professional singer and you want to talk about you know trying to a make it in tennis is one career he then starting in, in his 20s decided he wanted to be to do this and went to work on it and when I say he went to work on it, he went to work on it to become like the real deal. He ended up writing a book called The, the Magic Key to Tennis, which is about a, tech, a thing that, that we've always taught that you'd have to read the book. It's, it's a great thing about topspin and flat and how to aim. But it's also about his, his journey, uh, which, which is incredibly inspiring. And, and so I would definitely plug my brother's book. And, and I mean it. I, it's funny. I, when, when I read it, we're, we're super honest with each other. If I didn't think it was great, I would have said to him, but it's great. So that's, that would be my third choice. Awesome. And Christopher, can you repeat again the name of your brother's book? So, yeah. So my brother's book, and it's also his, he, his name is Eric Sage. He doesn't use crab, Eric Sage. And his, his book's called The Magic Key to Tennis. And it's cool. It's an inspirational read. It's, it's very cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Christopher. And so, uh, where can our audience connect with you and, and follow you to, to find out what you're up to? Oh, thanks for asking, man. So uh, my Instagram's kind of my main thing where I, I do, uh, videos of, of mainly tennis stuff. And again, my cute dogs and all those, and she should have her own, her own following. Cause she, she always steals the show. So yeah, mainly Instagram. That's, that's, I think the, the best place to catch me. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And to close, Christopher, what is one key tip that you could give our audience to help them improve their tennis games? I would say that going back to me saying that we need to change the name of, of tennis, at least for my students to watch, I would re recommend when people that are into tennis watch tennis on TV, start to, for instance, 
pick one thing. So for instance, if you were going to just watch one player's footwork for a game, it could really be helpful to start to realize how much pros are moving in split step. It's so fast, people don't know, it's, it's a blur to them. I would really recommend that to help their games to watch certain things. If they could, for instance, if they know the difference between a topspin ball and a slice ball, to really watch and go, I'm going to watch one of the players, the whole point, and watch and call it out. That's topspin. That's not, oh, they sliced. And again, for certain higher level players, they're going, obviously, I know that. You're not involved in this. You know how to watch. Good for you. <laughs> you don't have these, these. But for half the world playing, they don't. So it, you can glean a lot from watching. But again, not by watching the whole thing. It, you got to pick one little thing at a time. You don't have to watch the whole match like that and not make it fun. But it can be fun if you kind of just check out. Or for instance, I'll say to someone, just watch one of the player's serves motions. And I, I'll point to my students that some players drag their, 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 their back foot or some keep the platform and, and just kind of check that out. And the other thing is I would recommend listen to the announcers. So many things that tennis people come to me that tennis pros have told them, I think, where did they get that from? Happily, as you know, anything we ever watch on TV when these announcers are talking, they're spot on with everything they they say. They are the best of the best, and they're giving you nuggets all the time. I, I try to listen when I listen to golf to try to say, what did, and I'll rewind. What did he say about the take back there, and what? It, and then I'll also rewind things with golf to, to look at swings. So I think you can glean a lot from watching, but you got to watch carefully. Otherwise, it's too fast. Awesome, Christopher. Well, hey, thanks so much. Uh, that was a, a lot of great information there. Um, just in that one answer, let alone, you know, the hour plus we've been chatting, but definitely want to recommend that everybody check out Christopher's um, Instagram page and, and check out what he's doing, you know, him and his uh, dog as well. And I uh, just want to thank you so much for your, pa <laughs> for your passion for the game and, you know, your commitment to, uh, to high quality uh, level coaching. So thanks a lot, Christopher. Uh, it was a pleasure chatting with you and I hope we can chat again soon. Hey, let me thank you, man. How awesome. And it's, it's, it's a treat to get to talk to someone that is love like mine, that we know, you know, that you and I know we're talking about the same thing. And we, and I know that you get it all. And it's, it's, it's a joy. Man, and I love the show and it's awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Keep, Chris. keep doing what you do. Thank you. You too. Appreciate it. All right. I really hope that you enjoyed my interview with Christopher Crabb. And Christopher, thanks a lot for coming on to the show. And again, thanks to Olya for setting it up. Uh, it was a really fun conversation. And I highly encourage you all to check out Christopher's Instagram page. And we have a link to that in the show notes page at tennisfiles.com slash 237 or tennisfiles.com slash podcast, where you can find all of the different podcast episodes on there. And the link will be in your podcast app of choice that you use to listen to the show. And I would really appreciate it if you enjoy the Tennis Files podcast and if you find value from it, if you would leave a review for the show. And you can do that at tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts or in your podcast app of choice. Uh, I do find that leaving a review in Apple Podcasts gives it gives the show the most benefit in terms of it's just because the vast majority of people listen uh, to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, and so it'll rank it higher, and therefore more people will see it and benefit from it. So just a little tidbit there. But yes, thank you so much for that in advance. And I know that we have over 100 ratings and reviews, so uh, thanks to each and every one of you who have left them. I really do appreciate it, and I've read every single one of them. <laughs> so. Definitely, they have not gone unnoticed. And I do want to leave you with a quote, as I often do at the end of the show, and this one is by Vernon Howard. And Vernon said, Always walk through life as if you have something new to learn, and you will. Love that mindset there. All right, well, with that, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I obviously have some great interviews coming up, including with my good friend Peter Freeman about the serve, I believe. So look out for that soon. And with that, thanks for listening to the show and we'll see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is Maribon Aranshad signing out.